This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and use the J. Scott promo code when signing up to receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got a great episode with our friend Craig Steele of OrgHunt.com, exclusive pursuit outfitters and predator exclusives. And before we get to this episode with Craig, I wanted to let you guys know that Dar Colburn and I are going to be doing a free uh, turkey hunting seminar for the Desert Christian Archers on Tuesday, March 15th. That starts at 6 p.m. That is in uh, Phoenix, Arizona at the Calvary Community Church. It's in the Fellowship Hall, 12612 North Black Canyon Highway. Uh, We're going to be doing a seminar on turkey hunting, spring turkey hunting specifically, and uh, we had a nice turnout last year uh, for that Desert Christian Archers turkey hunting seminar. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys will get to uh, come out and uh, talk a little turkey here with us on the 15th of March. Uh, and I'd like to invite you guys to come. If you do come, they ask that you bring uh, to any, any food or toiletries for their food and toiletries drive. Uh, non-perishable food items or toiletries, soap, toothpaste, deodorant, and uh, canned goods, canned food. So it's a free seminar, but bring that out to uh, support uh, Calvary Community Church. I want to thank them for having them uh, you know, donate their building for us to uh, do a turkey hunting seminar. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to do a lot of videos, have a lot of photos, and we're going to have plenty of time for a question and answer for, for uh, turkeys. Uh, I also have a couple questions here uh, from podcast listeners. Hi, Jay. I began listening to your podcast a few months ago and really enjoy the format, style, and topics. I consider myself a novice in regards to the strategy and planning of Western Big Game applications. Therefore, I truly appreciated the unit-by-unit and species-by-species analysis of the states with upcoming application deadlines. Since I'm just beginning my journey into Western honey, i.e. I have zero points in every state, let me encourage you to consider an episode which addresses realistic application strategies for hunters at the various stages along the spectrum of points, zero, low, mid, high, and max. This could be presented in the format that if you, Jay Scott, or a guest had X points for this species in this state, how would you apply? I realize this could be challenging due to the differing goals we all have, but for a guy like you that enjoys chasing the diminutive and elusive coos deer, I'm convinced that you relish the challenge. Regardless, thanks for providing such a valuable valuable content and keep up the good work. I wish you all the best in this year's draws, Matt. Uh, Matt, that's great uh, podcast topics. I really appreciate the, um, the, the recommendation. And I appreciate your support with this podcast, and I will definitely do my best to see if I can have uh, in these upcoming episodes where we're breaking down the states. Our next state is New Mexico. Uh, We will talk about those with zero, low, mid, high, and max points. So thanks for the email. From Scott, Evening Jay, I thought of a killer podcast, Nate Simmons and yourself does discussing hunting public lands, scouting from tabletop to mountaintop. I marvel at Nate's DIY ability and think the conversation between the two of you would be a real value to all. Perhaps topics such as what things you absolutely must see from home before even considering going into an area, both on a map and unit reports. What do you key in on once in the unit? Do you feel field scout first and then decide on camp and what distance do you generally keep it from that area? Love to hear this banter back and forth between you two. Thanks for the podcast. Scott, I think that's um, another great uh, topic and um, hopefully Nate, I saw him at the Western Hunting and uh, Western Hunting Expo up in Salt Lake and um, 
hopefully he's going to be on here on the podcast and I'll uh, try and ask him a lot of those questions. Uh, I want to thank you for your support of my podcast and uh, sending me your ideas for podcast topics. Guys, I want to thank you for all the emails and all the positive comments that I get. Uh, and I just appreciate all the support, all the listening. Uh, the podcast is about a year old now. I launched it last uh, February 2015 in the last week. So we're right here on our um, on our one year anniversary. And uh, it's uh, been an unbelievable success. Thanks to you guys. Uh, I've had uh, pushing now 1.4 million downloads. And uh, without you guys' support, uh, my listeners, uh, I, I just owe a lot to you guys. I want to thank also our sponsors uh, for stepping up and making this podcast uh, enjoyable for you guys. So uh, I want to thank them. Uh, also, I want to point out uh, Dark Holborn and myself, uh, Hunter Haynes and a couple friends of ours, Dave and Reed, just got back from Mexico. Uh, we were able to scout a bunch of ranches uh, for coos deer and Gould's turkey. Uh, Dark Colburn and myself at uh, Colburn and Scott Outfitters. Uh, we have a few slots available for coos deer next season uh, in the uh, December, January time frame. Uh, so you can send me an email if you're interested in our coos deer hunts in Sonora, Mexico, as well as this spring here in a couple months, uh, basically from the last couple days of April through the 15th of May, uh, I have a few slots open for my Gould's turkey hunts and, uh, those are always fantastic hunts. So if you're interested in a Gould's turkey hunt, Send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com and I look forward to discussing those hunts with you and uh, uh, answering any questions you might have. I also want to thank you for all your support and thank you for uh, sending comments and, and emails uh, to, to my email and I try and respond to them as quickly as possible. Uh, usually within an hour I respond unless I'm out of town. So. Thank you for that. Uh, let's get right to this episode with Craig Steele and uh, get to hear what old Craig's got going on. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Craig Steele. Craig wears many hats, like I've told you before, exclusive pursuit outfitters, predator exclusives, orghunt.com. Craig, how you doing? I'm doing well, Jay. How you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty good. It looks like I've been following your predator hunting, and it looks like you've had a couple of great months of, of predator hunts here in northern northern Arizona. How's it going with that? It's going good, man. I love to do it. I know a couple of guys that guide first do a good job, and pretty much everybody has a good, fun time, and as long as the wind's not blowing 50, it's it's fun. You know, lately, um, the temperatures have actually really rose for February, and we've actually been in a hot spell. I mean, down here in Phoenix, it's supposed to be 90 degrees today, and uh, it seems like I've been, ever since I got back from Mexico coos deer hunting, I've been in shorts and um, really enjoying the weather, but I I've got to thank for what you're doing with predator hunting, uh, the, the warm snap uh, has got to put a little bit of a damper on your hunts. It does to, you know, to some degree. I mean, optimal conditions is, you know, after a storm system, cool and cloudy and at least for during the daylight hours. And um, that that's when it's kind of rocking. But, you know, you, you, you do what you can still. You know, I know we just I just got done. I got back last night from a two day hunt and the, the couple, they flew in from Michigan and you know, they were a little bit worried about the weather and. You know, we were able to call in, we were, we were targeting grays and bobcats, and we were able to call in, I think, four or five fox and, and a bobcat, which isn't bad considering, you know, the, the weather conditions and uh, high pressure had set in for a while, and uh, we had some wind, so it was hot. And um, But, you know, we actually, uh, yesterday, didn't call anything in until uh, noon, and he got looked at me and said, is this normal? I said, well, I said, sometimes it happens, you know, where you, where you don't call anything in, 
you know, for a certain number of hours or in the morning when you think you should. And then, you know, right after that, we called in a gray and she shot it. And then two stands later, we call in two grays and they shot both of those. So, um, you know, it was during the middle of the day that we actually called stuff in, but we were set up right on them. Um, when it gets windy like that, the predators aren't going to come from that far. Um, they're just not going to put themselves out there. They, they just don't do it most of the time. And so it does, it does. Unless they're hungry enough or unless there's a challenge, what's the deal? I mean, like a deer, they just, deer or sheep or elk, they just kind of want to lay there and they're, you know, it's hot. So they want to lay in the shade much like we would if it was hot. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you book a hunt or you do a predator contest, you know, you, you you have to hunt those weather conditions and, you know, those, those animals, they don't care about you book to hunt um or you're on a predator contest or whatever they're 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 focused is survival and and that is you know to to be lazy when it's not optimal conditions um and you know there's there's times when i've seen coyotes when it's blowing 30 40 miles an hour i've actually physically watched coyotes on the opposite side of my truck stand up hear my call and then lay back down and then go and reset up on them, get within three, 400 yards and call them in within the first minute. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think, well, they can't hear me, you know, so thus they're not going to come because it's windy or whatever. You know, the reality of it is sometimes they can hear you. They just, they don't feel comfortable in the wind and they're not going to expose themselves, you know, because they're living out there you know, getting their butt kicked, ass handed to them, excuse my language, for, you know, lack of better terms, day in and day out. It's a survival for them. And so if it's not optimal conditions, then, you know, it gets a little bit harder. You know, and part of that is with with the heat is, you know, they're they're going to be laying up, being lazy and uh, conserving themselves for a better time to, to hunt or defend territory or, you know, breed. So it, it it can make it rough. The weather dictates a lot, a lot. And, and there's a lot of, you know, got a lot of guys ask like, okay, what's, what's the best time and when's the best time. And, you know, there's a lot of things I don't know, you know, I mean, and I'm sure you're this way with, I mean, if I draw it up, the best time is, you know, mid December after a three day storm system, um, and the wind's blowing out of the north at eight to ten miles an hour, and we're hunting the next two days. That's you know with with a, a new moon. But you know, try to get that. You know, it's it's pretty hard. You know, so you kind of hunt with the weather you have, and 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 you know just keep grinding it out and go for it. Which animal comes the furthest? <sighs> the one that's the hungriest or <laughs> or the meanest uh, i mean i you know again i if if i if i kind of laid that out there i i would be just lying to everybody if i knew that exact fact i, I tend to believe that coyotes will um out of, of and i'm just speaking of three species gray fox coyotes and bobcats um, I tip, you know, at this time, that's what I'm speaking about. I tend to think that the coyotes do, um, then what's next? Um, I would say bobcats and then grays, uh, are, are less, but grays come super hard. Um, and I was going to say what, co- who comes in the fastest, uh, anything, whatever animals closest to the call. <laughs> but 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 on I'm trying to make a podcast episode but here, but it's the it's the <laughs> truth. I mean, whatever animals laying closest to the call, if you're playing distress sound, um, you know, coyotes can obviously they can run the fastest um, out of all three of those animals. Um, a big male coyote is is deadly. Um, grays typically come fast because you're usually set up on them. Grays typically typically. I use, there's three terms. I never say never and I never say always because then, then you get pigeonholed and something happens. And if, if I use those terms, it's, it's really out of ignorance. 
um, and it's not given. It, it's making me sound like I know what the animals are doing 24/7, and I have no clue. As much as I hunt, I still don't. I still don't have the mind of of that predator. Um, again, they're living in it, breeding in it. I mean, doing all that stuff, and it's their world, and you're just going into it for a moment. But as far as you know, speed, typically, you know, coyotes, you know, either younger coyotes that, uh, you know, for lack of better terms, haven't been called or pressured, um, or very, very territorial coyotes that feel super comfortable. Those two type, type of coyotes, if I had to categorize coyotes, those are the ones that typically come um, very, very hard. And as far as fox, generally speaking, um, overall as a species, they're going to come harder to the call than overall as, uh, you know, as compared to coyotes. Uh, bobcats, um, you know, you read a lot how I've had bobcats come running in, but they oftentimes will set up and stop. They'll come and then they'll stop. Some will walk in between those stops, um, between setting up and observing. Some will run. Um, some will run in there to 50 yards and stop. But uh, they, generally speaking, will set up and stop and kind of evaluate the, the scenario and try to get sight on what's going on. Um, whereas fox, a lot of times, will barrel in. Um, coyotes will barrel in or they'll go to the wind. Um, and that's what makes coyote hunting so tough is they go to the wind a lot. If a coyote and a fox are coming to the call at the same time will and they see each other, will the coyote, you know, outrun the fox or run the fox over or try and intimidate the fox? Or have you ever had multiple species coming in and they see each other at the at the site? Yeah, I've had coyotes and bobcat come in, um, but usually the bobcat's sitting up watching. Um, and then the coyotes come in. Um, coyotes are typically the more dominant species over, over grays. Um, and gray, that's why a lot of times in Arizona, and I know there's, speaking of, you know, the Southwest, you know, grays live in the mountains, um, and boulder piles and cover. Um, and that's so that they can hide and get away from coyotes because if they get, they get tangled up with the wrong coyote, they're dead. Um, cause very territorial coyotes will kill them. Um, so, you know, if, if that, if that happens, I haven't had gray and coyote come to the call at the same time, but, but I would imagine that the, you know, depending on the gray's personality, um, I imagine the gray would, would retreat for cover to higher ground. What is the best month to hunt coyotes? What is the best month to hunt bobcat and what is the best month to hunt fox absolute here we go uh this is your gut it's yeah, i'm mean, not going to hold it, you if to i it. had to pick you know on average it would be december this is for me personally um in the southwest um for me it would be december for coyotes um january for fox and i love for whatever reason february for cats I mean, it's for a bunch of different reasons, but December seems to be, um, again, when everybody goes coyote or predator hunting, they just throw out that term loosely. Um, and so a lot of guys are going out um, as far as on stuff that's open to the public. Um, a lot of guys are going out in, you know, November and December for coyotes. Um, but they don't. I think you can get away with letting some bobcat areas and some fox areas go to late January and into February because guys aren't aren't calling for them specifically. They're just happy to get something to the call. So I guess maybe it's because I kind of hone in on those months to go after those species. Um, what are the worst months to, to predator call? Um, I mean... You know, I like good furred up animals, so I, I don't like to call during the summer. Um, it's it's kind of my break. It's my off season, and I just I just don't um, call during the summer months. From from you know, you start getting into May around here, it starts getting really really windy a lot. May and June's real windy and dry. Um, with that being said, you know, with some nighttime calling or or around water can be very effective. Um, 
but I, I just I just don't enjoy 110 degrees calling coyotes. So it's maybe not as much of a factor as it, the calling won't be good. It's more of a factor of, you, you know, it's kind of your off season. You don't call three, you know, 365 days a year. Um, much like I like to hunt sheep, at, you know, certain time of year. I like to hunt turkeys certain mm-hmm. times a year, and I like to fish certain times a year. Yeah, no, kind of like exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I, mean, can, I can still catch a long. fish. I can catch a fish pretty much any time of the year. But I like to fish for trout in the summer, that type of thing. Yeah, it's definitely going to the optimal times. Our kind of season that we kind of, you know, October kind of is when guys start going out. Um, but we really like November through March. Um, that's, you know, and, and November to, to February is uh, optimal, I would say. Um, and so that that's kind of, you know, that's when when I'm in predator mode, you know, is, is that during that time period for the most part. Gotcha. Well, let's take a break here. And then I've got a question from a podcast listener that I want to, uh, you and I can answer. At GoHunt.com, we are restoring the heritage of the old and constantly redefining the new. We stay focused and put our efforts into redefining the future of Western hunting. What makes us special? What makes us different? We are are the new breed of hunter. We are the customers that we serve. We are the innovators and we are the future. Visit GoHunt.com slash insider and join the movement. Use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code until February 28th to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Okay, Craig, we got a, a email in here from Reed, and Reed says, Hi, Jay, want to start off by saying thanks for the great podcast. I think you do a great job of providing a lot of good and needed information to the hunting community and to the general public. I'm a hunter that puts in for tags across the West, uh, let's see, Western states each year, and I'm also the type of hunter who would hire a guide if I got lucky enough to draw one of those life, once in a lifetime tags. I think a podcast on how to select a good guide service would help a lot of guys like myself out. What questions to ask? what to look for, what type of licenses to ask for, that kind of stuff. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Reed. You going to start this one? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, your question of, um, you know, you put in for tags across the West and you're the type of hunter that would hire a guide. Um, you know, your, your first question is uh, how to select a good guide. Um, well, first and foremost, I think any guide that you're talking to has to be able to provide a reference list. And in my mind, that reference list should be long. And I think it's important to talk to as many people as you can that have hunted with that particular person or that particular outfitting company. Because I think the larger you get as an outfitting company, you know, the more guides you have, you you know, you could have 20 guides under one umbrella and have, you know, five guides that are excellent and 15 that are just so, so, Mm -hmm. you know, and then you could have outfits that, you know, all 20 guides are fantastic. Um, So the first I would ask for is references. What what would be the first thing you would ask for, Greg? I I think... I think references is is definitely a huge one um, from both you know the guide and and or the outfitting business you know however it works you want to make sure you get that because you know um, you you want to hear those stories and you want to talk to those people and they may feel like they can disclose some things to you that that you know maybe 
you know, you, you wouldn't hear anywhere else. Um, you know, right. Like you want to get like the inside, the, the nitty gritty, what happens in camp, you know, yes. when things aren't How going people well. How act and what kind of camp they run. Is it organized? Um, you know, organization. Did they, did they have some scouting time? Did they know the area? Were, were the guides honest? Were they on time? You know, how they present themselves? Were they, you know, were they there to, you know, basically help you? Um, and I think the other thing, too, is, you know, I mean, depending on what state it is and, and realistic expectations, um, you know, um, you, know you, you hear so many stories. Jay and I live, live in Arizona, so, and, and then there's Utah, Nevada, and there's certain units or game management units in each, each state that produce quality animal. But you hear so many stories out there of, 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 of people throwing out, you know, or buying into just just a buck or a bull or, you know, something like that that somebody flashes a trail camera picture of. And, you know, you, you want to get into the, the details of, of, you know, what are you not Don't just buy into just one a story. You know, of you know, some buck. What do you mean, like here, like one one trail camera photo, and he's booking nine people off of one photo, yeah, and I the mean, reality is only one person gets to hunt that buck, exactly. not all nine. Okay, it, exactly. Is is like you know, you want to make sure that the expectations are right, and that don't don't just buy. You know, as I guess working it backwards is, you know, when you call an out there, you know, ask him the questions. You know. And if, if all he talks about is, you know, I got this big buck and he's for you, you know, and he's selling you just on one animal, you know, as a, as a draw tag holder, just, just make sure you talk about, okay, how's camp and how much do you scout and how familiar are you with the area? Make sure the guides are, you know, that, that the outfitter or guide, you know, if you're not going with that guide, make sure that the outfitter can give you, you know, talking names of his guides and he's just not you know, trying to book you with what other, with whatever sub guide he can go find, you know, um, and that's kind of... Let, let's talk about that a little bit. You bring up a good point. I think for Reed, you know, asking the question, I, I think, I think it's pretty important that if, you know, if you're calling an outfit to go with them on a guided hunt, how important is it for you to know the guide that you will actually be going with out in the field? And how important is it to you, Craig, do you feel like that you should, as the hunter, be able, you're Reed here looking to book a hunt. How important is it that now you've talked to the outfitter, but now I want to talk to the actual person that I'm going to be going with? How important is that? I think it's important. Um, and I think it's important for, for, the outfitter to disclose as much as he possibly can um, because if he can't give you that then that may be something that you know you elect to go with a smaller outfit for you know that that may be a sticking point or for you it may not be a huge hurdle if he gives you a list and you go okay one of these guys right here are going to be my guide that's fine but if you're able to talk to the actual guide you know I mean how is that not a selling point you know how is that not a comforting thing you know, to, to be able to do that, you know, now, mind you, there is a lot of sub guides, you know, we have sub guides for us that, that, you know, they're working another job or anything. So they may not be able to answer you or call you right then. It may take a week or two, you know, but you need to, I, I think it's a huge selling point. I think it's a huge comfort issue for, for that, uh, for you as a client or somebody to looking, you know, looking at, um, uh, buying a hunt or, or, or booking a hunt. You know, another thing is you know, look at the pictures on their website and, um, or websites. And, you know, if they're, if they're using names of people that are actually guiding other guiding hunts, I mean, that, that's a huge, huge deal. You know, I mean, you know, if, if you see, you know, five photos and there's no names of who's guiding the hunter, you know, or no mention of any of the guides that are on their supposed list, you know, ask them, okay, how come, how come there's no names, you know, with the pictures, um, who, who's got, gui who's guiding these guys? Um, because, you know, I look at booking hunts, like try to disclose everything I possibly can. And because 
I want the hunter's expectations to be met when he gets to camp, when he comes there. Um, and, and I want him, I want to treat that hunt as if my dad was booking the hunt. If I treat it that way, if I say, Hey, here's my, here, here's my good buddy, Jimmy Hoffman, and he's freaking better at antelope than me, then I mean it. You know what I mean? And, and I think, you know, within guiding and I know you know for you and I we're we're in Arizona but I know there's a lot bigger outfitters in some of these other states you know so I know but a, but a lot of their hunts you know like a Colorado you know basically elk factory guides service I'm just using generic terms here I mean they're running a lot more hunters and I think their expectations because the wait time's not there is probably a lot lower you know what I mean um, that then, you know, waiting 15 years for your, your Utah limited entry archery elk tag. I mean, so, sure. you know, I, what I, about I, price? What about price? I mean, I think that price needs to be discussed because I think sometimes on both ends of the spectrum, if, you know, you're looking at an elk hunt and, you know, someone's saying I'll charge, you know, $3,500, and the same elk hunt, you talk to another guy and he's charging, you know, ninety five hundred dollars and then there's a bunch of guys in the mid range of you know five to seven thousand dollars you know some people are going to look at the thirty five hundred dollar guy and say that's my man and my question to you is is cheapest ever the best well it is hunting so i mean they're like i mean you and i try to control as much as we possibly can by scout knowing the area, you know, and for us exclusive pursuit outfitters, you know, having guys, you know, scout and putting the guide with the right hunter for with the right expectations. But, you know, so there is a certain amount of luck that goes into that. A guy could go book a $500 elk hunt and, and, you know, they luck out and kill a 400 inch bull, but that's the exception to the rule, right? You know, I mean, it's all a value proposition. I mean, what fits within your budget and whatnot, but, you know, I think, you know, and this is just giving you some, some props. I mean, if a guy can book, you know, a hunt with Jay Scott, I mean, that has some huge value, you know, Jay's like, Hey, you're going to be going with me and you're my only guy. You know I mean? That that's, that's some huge value there. Um, so it, it's up to the individual, I would be cautious. You know, I had a guy email me. I'm going to talk about predator hunts for just a second. I got a guy email me um, like a month ago, and he's like, you know, and this is the first time I ever had this happen. And and on my on the predator exclusives website, we we disclose our our prices um, just because it's more of a trip oriented deal and not you know draw and buy, you know, the actual the uh, there's so many things different in the draw and different options for that but for our predator hunting we basically offer daily rate this is what it is for one person this is what it is for two or more person people you know it's 400 bucks a day and then it's 350 bucks per day per person for anything more than two people and uh you know the guy emailed me and he's like i was going to book a predator hunt with you but then i saw you charge 400 bucks a day and that's ludicrous blah 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 i went on rambled rambled and told me how my clients are all idiots and you know, I sat there and let it burn for a little bit, and I thought, you know, he's he's upset at the price and because he can't come. And I and I I sat there for a little while, and I'm like, should I email him back? And I emailed him back, and I said, man, I said, the reality of it is, you know, I, I appreciate you contacting me. You know, I didn't like that he called, you know, guys that came and hunted with me, you know, idiots. Because I'm like, I know, you know. 90% of the guys, 95% of the guys I hunt with aren't idiots and uh, they're really good people. And I, I said, it obviously isn't within your value proposition, you know, and it doesn't. So, so you're probably not going to come hunt with me and that's fine. You don't have to get offended by it, but you know, I can't lower my price because then it's not worth my time. And I know that sounds kind of straightforward, but it's the truth. And, you know, I think a lot of guys that try to drop their price, the market always, I mean, it is what it is. The market will correct that and, you know, they won't, you can't guide in the hole, you know, it just. Did he respond back? He didn't respond. 
and and that's fine. You know, I get I get the same thing with um, my Gould's turkeys. Um, well, with other animals too, but it seems like with the Gould's turkeys, you know, guys email and they say, "What's your price?" And I tell them, and they say, "Wow, I, I you know, I can I can get it cheaper somewhere else." And I fire right back and say, "Absolutely!" And I wish you the best and hope you have a great hunt. And you know, if you want to hunt with us, that's what it's going to cost. And you know, sometimes they come back and say, you know, there's no way I would pay that money, da, 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 da. And then there's other people that are, you know, fighting to get in line to get a spot yeah. to go. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody has their own value system, like you said. Yeah. I do think it is funny and not funny, like funny, ha, ha. Like, I just think it's funny how... Sometimes people are quick to get nasty, and I just like good night. We I've never even met this person. They're upset over the pricing structure, and they're getting nasty. <laughs> and it's like, what is going on? And I then I step back. You know, I want to you know snap right back with an email, but I'm I have to usually take a second and say. You know, there's obviously something going on in this person's life that. The, you know they're having a bad day. They're ha and everybody's entitled to have a bad yeah. day or a bad second. Um, but it just seems like people are very quick these days to snap uh, into being nasty pretty quick, and it's unfortunate. Um, but you know, back to uh, Reed's question. You know, I think a great question to ask is you know, what is the price of your hunt and what does that include? Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes when you don't have what's included in the hunt um, and, and things get left out and it's not very well communicated, I think that's where you can have disagreements and where one person was thinking one thing, the outfitter was thinking another, and it leads to someone being unhappy. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important a question to ask is, you know, what is included in that price? And then sometimes you might find out that that higher price that actually is completely justified and maybe even the highest price, let's say you're looking at 10 guides, maybe the highest price out of all of them, maybe come to find out they're actually offering way more of a service uh, than, than even the guys in the middle mm -hmm. and maybe not. Mm hmm. You know, but I, I think that's important. Um, no, it is, and it, and if it's within your budget, then you know, then why not go for it? You know, I mean, it's you know, we all have different value propositions, and like you said, you, you you know, the highest price, pretty much a good rule of thumb in in my opinion in life is you, you do get what you pay for for the majority of things. I mean, it just there's a reason you're paying a higher price most of the time. Um, you know. And, and and sometimes you find a bargain, you know what I mean? I mean, I mean truthfully, sometimes you find a bargain, but that's that, that that's not the norm. And and you know, m most guides, you know, that that have been around or or you know are are serious about it realize that it takes a lot of time and effort to to build something and to do do a good job. And so you know, you're gonna pay you know, you're going to pay in the solid market range. You're not going to be, you know, paying, you know, a thousand bucks for an elk hunt, you know? Yeah. 15 Let's take a quick break here. And then I, I've got another point to make about uh, Reed's question. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at PhoneScope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com or on Instagram at PhoneScope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com 
and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order in February 2016. Personally, I think booking a hunt, uh, one more thing that, that I think is important is photos and video of the exact hunt that you're going on. Um, if I'm going to go elk hunt in Colorado or, or uh, you know, go on a deer hunt somewhere, a turkey hunt, I would like to see photos of the country that I'm hunting. I would like to see photos of the guide that I'm going with in with animals that are harvested that we're actually going after. So if it's, you know, bull elk, I want to see the guy I'm going with in photos. Um, and I want to see where, you know, for sure that, that he is the guy that he says he is. Mm -hmm. And I think it's real easy for one big bull elk photo or one big bighorn sheep photo you know, to sit, you know, that be my flagship photo for the guide service. And, you know, you say, well, okay, I'm going to book with, you know, you know, Joe Blow and send me some pictures with Joe Blow that, you know, where's some of his successful clients, they better dang sure be able to produce photos of Joe Blow with whatever it is you're hunting. Yeah. And if they don't, I think that's a problem and with the you know I think there's some people that are better at photos and videos and you know posting them on their website than others but I also think it's it's not very hard to do these days and with technology these days it, you know it throws up a little bit of a red flag if they don't have those photos and videos yeah and, and I think to me I posted this the other day or a couple of weeks ago I mean Video validates what I do. I actually try to get all of our guides to to videotape everything, and it's a challenge, you know. I mean, it, it is. I mean, even after the shot, you know, or after when the animal's down, just just to show that experience with that guide and with that hunter. Um, it, 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 people get caught in the heat of the moment. For me, it just comes naturally, and and video is king in marketing, um, and. And, and I know you're this way. It, it just it shows the credibility. Um, and you you know we've both had pictures and stuff stolen, and and I found them on other outfitters or wannabe guides as you know platforms, web platforms, posting the pictures pretending that that they're you know hunting these animals. And it's I mean you get that. And so, you know, as, as somebody that would be looking, that's looking for a guide, you know, you, you want to put all the pieces together and the more, the more pieces to the puzzle that you have, as far as, as Jay said, uh, you know, getting the list of references, um, asking what kind of experience level, um, is, is your guide and, and, you know, knowing who's he, who's he, who has he guided or she guided before, you know, um, is there any uh, pictures of them uh, with cl or with clients and su unsuccessful hunts? Um, the video, you know, who who are these 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 guides and these outfitters um, or, or these clients? I mean, is there video proof of it? Um, it? You know, how long have you been guiding? I know for us, we haven't been you know exclusive pursuit outfitters. Lee's been guiding for a while. Um, I've actually haven't been guiding consistently until 2000. 13. So, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge when there's some, some guys that have been around for, for 20, 30 years, at least in Arizona. Um, but, uh, you know, so experience is there again, Lee and I, Lee's been around for a while, but myself, I've only been around for two or three years, but I've also, you know, <laughs> I've done a lot of hunts in two or three years. So that, that helps a ton, but, you know, you got to put all those pieces together, um, and, and make sure that, you know, you're doing your due diligence and and uh, finding the right outfit for you. Well, and yeah, and I'm going to also go a step further and say as a guide these days, in my opinion, if you want to be taken seriously as a professional um, and photographing and videoing isn't your strength, you know what, you're going to have to you're going to have to buck up and you're just going to have to do it. 
I, I agree. Because, it, you know, if you want to be a professional, if you want to be able to get good dollars for your work, then there's a lot more to being a guide, in my opinion, than being a good hunter and being able to put people on animals. I think there's way more to it. And I think, you know, sometimes people just have to grow and get out of the old school of way of thinking and, you know, actually get off their duff and, you know, get a camera and commit to taking 25 photos a day, whether the hunt goes good or bad. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're taking 25 photos or 10 photos or 50 photos, you know, whatever you set out to do, you know, I try and take photos when I sit down to glass, uh, when I'm packing up my gear, before I leave a knob, when I get to a new knob, when we take lunch, you know, throughout the whole hunt. So I've kind of documented and you would be surprised. I mean, we're talking with these point and shoot cameras, we're talking taking one minute out of your time, maybe two minutes total to stand there and take a couple scenery shots, to take a couple pictures of your client glassing, it does not take that much time. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that hunt, then you can piece together a nice picture of the whole hunt. You can, you can paint the picture of the whole experience that, that, you know, that, that, that you're trying to show. And I, I just, I cringe when I hear guides not taking photos and not taking video well, I, because I, it's, it's unexcusable in my mind. If you want to be taken seriously as a guide, you need to gather content. I, try, I mean, I, trust me, and it, the, that's a battle that I beat into our guides' heads, and it is. I mean, it pisses you off, for lack of better terms, because it's like it's just a photo. I mean, everybody's got a smartphone. You know what I mean? You, you can take phenomenal photos with just your iPhone, you know? Right. And, and so it's, it's one of those things. And, and for the client, too, you know, and that's kind of what you were talking about before, you know. I mean, if he gets a bunch of pictures and stuff like that that goes along with his hunt, not to mention video, I mean, that's a huge deal. You know, when, when somebody's waited, you know, I mean, even if, the, even if they come after two or three years and they hunt, you know, let's say Colorado or they get lucky and draw Arizona or whatever, you know, it's still an experience that they may only experience once, you know? And so, you know, we were talking about this the other day though, that, you know, also as a, as a client, you know, if, if, if I put myself in the client's shoes, what are you in it for? You know, what, what's your goal? You know, talk to the, talk to the guide, um, or outfitter about, okay, what, what's, you know, and I hate to use the term realistic, but that's the reality. What, what, what is the hunt, what type of hunt did I apply for and draw or book and, or I'm going to book and what's my expectations? Um, and what's my chances of actually killing an animal? What's my chance of actually killing a trophy animal, whether that be, you know, let's turns a belt, whether it be a 300 inch, 350 or 380 plus, what's my chances? And, and, you know, what what uh basically what what what's is realistic for for uh for that and so i i think a lot of hunters you know need to understand that you know it's still a hunt and so you can't just you're not guaranteed to you know go out there and kill an animal and it and if you ex disclose that i mean if you talk about that before the hunter is booked as an outfitter, it's something that's not fun to talk about when other outfitters are, you know, throwing out the 400 inch mark all the time. But also, I guess this leads me to another thing. Trust your gut. Who's, I mean, are you buying a hunt that's, you know, uh, a canned hunt? No. If you're buying a fair chase hunt, you still have to go out there and hunt the animal. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of questioning. I know, I don't know about you, Jay, but for me, it's like, when I talk to a client nowadays, it's like, okay, how many animals have you killed with a bow that's booking an archery elk hunt? How far can you shoot? What kind of shape are you in? Have you ever elk hunted before? And I'm not just, yeah. I'm not just taking the phone call and saying, yeah, I want to book you. You know what I mean? Be so you're, in essence, you're interviewing the client to see if it's something that you even want to take that person. Yeah, because if he doesn't and, have and the I get it all the time. Yeah. 
I want a, I want a 380 bull and I want a seven day hunt and I want it to be as cheap as Joe Blow that I just talked to. Can you beat that price? And I say, well, you know, how many elk have you killed with your bow? Uh, well, I haven't killed any yet. Okay. Um, you know, what kind of shape are you in? Well, I could lose a few pounds. That, 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 that's the one thing when I hear that, I just shake my head because it's like, I've heard that and they show up and they're 20 pounds overweight. And I've heard them say that and it's, they're 70 pounds overweight. And it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm X amount old and I've got a sore, you know, a bum knee and I've got a replaced hip or, and you know, the list just keeps going. And then you're, you've got to say, buddy, you know, with all of those things that you're telling me, we're going to be fortunate to get an elk. Mm -hmm. And and there's you outfitters know? that will tell you, yeah, you got a great chance of killing a 380 in those conditions. And that's just a crock of crap and because you don't. And I think the number one thing for myself and our outfit that we get that is is older rifle hunters that have never hunted archery that draw an archery tag and then shoot their bow for two months and this is i'm not you know you know trying to you know point out a certain demographic that's just you know you guys suck or something like that but it's the truth and then they, their expectations are, man, I want to kill a 370 inch bull. And, you know, it's going back to that predator thing. Those animals live out there. They don't care who you are. They don't care how much money you got. They don't care what bow you have. You know, it takes skill, effort, and a little bit of luck. And, it, and if, if you don't put in the effort and you don't have the skill, that luck gap gets way way smaller and i mean you're just limiting yourself and so i think as as a client i would i would throw red flags if the outfitter's not questioning you if he's not asking you because if he's not asking you what your abilities are he just in my opinion he just wants to take your money and he does he's not looking out there and, and going hey man i want to make sure this guy's successful so if I know he's overweight, if I know he has an archery hunted, I know what I need to send him. I know what information I need to give him. I know, you know, that I need to text him, you know, once a week and say, hey, are you shooting your bow? Hey, shoot me some pictures of, of your grouping and stuff like that. And so, you know, for me, I want every hunt that we do to be successful. I know that's not realistic, but you dang sure want to paint the, the realistic expectations. You want to be honest with the client, not just take their money. You know, and and that's that's one of my biggest pet peeves is in the outfit world. It's it seems like you know as well as I do in Arizona, everybody's calling and wanting to book hunts, but it's like stop for a second. We're all taking these people's money, but we're not really. Let's tell them the truth. How freaking hard is it to kill a big ass bull elk? It's harder than shit, and so. Now, I mean, that's just honesty right there. And, and, and really, and I'll take a guy that's, it's his first year, you know, hunting our trail. I've done it before. And it's like, okay, what's it, how hard is it going to be? It's going to be super hard, but I'm willing to, you know, go to war with you for lack of better terms to do that. If you know the expectations, you know, or if you're a super savvy bow hunter and you want to kill a giant elk, okay. But this is the realistic expectations. Now let's go do it. You know what I mean? But I think right. in in our world, it's so quick. Like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. We kill 380s all the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's book with you. It's like, okay, now what? You know, do you treat every hunter the same? Well, you're getting for us. We're getting, you know, four or five guys to camp with all sorts of different skill levels. You know, so you have to be honest with the guys and you and you have to really, you know, make sure you tell them what they need to work on or what they don't need to work on, you know, so. Yeah. And, you know, I'd like to bring up a point of I think personally, some of the guides um, here, I am speaking a lot to the guides, but, you know, I think there's a level of professionalism that needs to be increased 
uh, from the guide's perspective to the clients. And I think there's more respect that needs to be given to the clients. And I think there needs to be, uh, you know, y you don't need to be bad talking your client. And because like you said, everybody comes with different skill levels. And just because you put him in a situation, him or her in a situation where you could have made the shot. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they can make the shot. And the reason they're hiring you is because obviously they don't have the time to scout or they don't know the country or maybe they don't know how to hunt elk or archery deer or sheep or turkey or whatever it is. Or maybe they do know how to hunt, but, you know, they don't have time to get up there and prowl around and see what's shaking. Or maybe they're an absolute fantastic hunter, but they feel like their best opportunity is to hire someone else that's equally as good of hunter, but also knows the country, and, and they value that as important. But, um, you know, part of my questioning to the outfitter and the guide is I'm going to kind of get a sense of, you know, am I dealing with a good person mm -hmm. here? Or am I dealing someone that has spent the last 30 minutes telling me why they didn't kill a 400-inch bull last year because their client was out of shape, overweight, couldn't shoot, what have you. And I hear it a lot, and I see it a lot on social media, where guides are being unprofessional and being immature, in my opinion, and ratting their clients out to try and make themselves look good instead of just saying, you know what, my client hired me because they're not as good a hunter as I am and I should have realized that from the beginning. So I need to make sure that I put them in situations that they're comfortable with mm -hmm. and shots and I need to build them a rest and take extra time because they are not a crack shot. Mm -hmm like the guide is yep. or you know they can't shoot a hundred yards through a small opening with a crosswind of 15 miles an hour or you know they can't just drop down and shoot a coos deer running across a ridge at 300 yards you know quartering away wide open mm -hmm. why do they hire a guide well half of them hire a guide because they don't have a clue what they're doing mm -hmm. that doesn't give the guides the reason to be throwing their clients under the bus when i hear I, you know, I heard uh, several years ago some guide services, several of them, saying, well, if I had clients that could shoot, we'd have done this, this, and this. Mike, as a guide, as an outfitter, a as a hunter, I look at that and shake my head and say, you're the guide. Mm -hmm. They missed the shot because you didn't put them in the right situation most of the time. Mm -hmm. Granted, everybody misses shots. And everybody steps on a branch at the wrong time and everybody coughs at the wrong time and everybody clanks their bow and their arrow falls off the rest. That happens. Mm -hmm. And if you're so high and mighty that, you know, you're such as, oh, I'm the greatest guide in the world and nothing ever happens, you haven't hunted and you haven't guided that much. Yeah. And I'm getting a little bit fired up here just talking about it, but it, it makes me cringe when I hear about oh, we'd have done awesome this year if my clients would shoot. If I hear that as someone booking a hunt, I, I don't ever want to book a hunt with someone like that, ever, yeah. period, never. No, for sure. I mean, like you said, it's 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 one of those things that you as a professional hunting guide uh, need to really realize that you are the professional and that, you know, occasionally you'll get somebody that's got the skill level that you do, but the majority of the people don't. And that's why they're, you know, and they don't have the time or the knowledge of the unit and they've waited 20 years and it's the only time that they're going to be able to hunt this tag. And that's why they hired you, you know? And so, you know, it's just like hunting with, hunting with my wife, I, you know, and once you can get those, I, I know what her, I just I'm going all over the place, but once you can get their their skill levels, you know what you have to work with. Just like with my wife, I know she does this, this, and this well, and she doesn't do this, this, and this well. But you have to have those discussions, and not, you know, if it doesn't happen, then you didn't do your job as a guide. 
you know? Right. And I, I, and I think knowing your clients' weaknesses, you're there to cover up their weaknesses. You're there not to expose their weaknesses. You're there to make them look good. You're there to make them feel good. And you're there to, for, for, to harvest a good animal and to have a great hunt. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and, I feel very strongly about this. I feel like, you know, the level of professionalism needs to be raised. And if your client can't shoot worth a darn, then you need to get them closer. And you need yep. to talk with them about taking the right shot. And if you know they can't shoot, yep. you don't go tell the world, well, we're never going to kill a bull. My client can't shoot. You need to mask their weaknesses. You need to make up for their weaknesses. You need to, you need to cover them. And then after the hunt, when they shoot a bull, you don't go and say, Oh, I can't even believe we got a, this guy, da, 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 it, It's classless. Yeah. And it bothers me, and I'm sure you can tell it bothers me. Um, Jay's getting fired up. I feel like I'm getting old enough now where I can, I can you know, say some of these things, and maybe some, some guides out there, you know, some, some hunters and some guides can learn from it. And, you know, it, it's it's... It's our job to, as professionals, to, you know, take care of those people that pay us money to take them on hunt. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. So, well, buddy, it's been awesome having you on here. Um, what do you have coming up? Uh, I, I'm headed to Mexico to look at some ranches for Gould's turkey and for coos deer. And then uh, Dar and I are actually doing a turkey hunting seminar for Desert Christian Archers. We did it last year. This year it's uh, March 15th, um, that's uh, 6 p.m. at Calvary Community Church, which is down on I-17, and I want to say it's down by like Cactus or Thunderbird. Um, that's what I've got going on, just waiting for turkey season. What do you got? Um, I got uh, one of my best clients, Ian Chapel, and friend. Um, Ian Chapel coming back to try to go hunt lions again the end of this month. Um, and that's what I got going on. So that'll be, um, the end of February. Hopefully we're able to get another big. Okay. So look, I got to ask you about that. You, you can't say that and not have me ask a question. You guys set out to call a mountain lion. Yeah. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at Utah Hydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. And how many sets did it take? And, and just tell me about... Okay. Um, tell me about what, what, what went on. Ian, first got to give... You know, going back to clients and, you know, when you get guys like Ian girls, whatever. I mean, just like the last three groups I had, they, it literally becomes, they literally, I mean, be, they become friends. Um, and whether or not you, you know, people believe in mixing business with pleasure or whatever, but they do, um, when they're clients that you really click with. But Ian, Ian has hunted predator hunts, a bunch of predator hunts with us. Um, and a, a couple with me, um, he, he did an elk hunt where, where I was there and, uh, 
Um, so he, he has total trust and he wanted to come back and hunt lion. Um, and he wanted to try to call lion in. And I said, okay, I've never done it before. And so who books a lion hunt? I, I told some archer deer hunters that we had and they go, you ever done it before? I said, no, but I think I can. And you know, Ian knew that, um, it, it, he trusted me, he, you know, he knows I'm going to look him in the eye and, and I'm going to tell him the truth. You know, whether it be what he wants, it, it, it's not always going to be what he wants to hear or, or what I want to say. You know, I want to say I've called in a hundred lions, but I haven't. Um, so we went out, we made the decision, we're going to go try to call lion. And I had one specific area that I wanted to start at, um, but I couldn't do it because my, my forerunner was in the shop getting the transmission rebuilt. So um, I loaded up my quad and <laughs> in the back of my F-250 and we rode freaking tandem on my quad for two days um, <laughs> and so we hunted a different area another area that was just it'd been the last couple of years i'd actually like the two dumb and dumber yes, guys it was and we made reference <laughs> to that several times uh you know the the mindset going is is you know my mindset with calling predators is um you know you call for a specific animal and occasionally you're going to get animals that show up that aren't that specific animal because they overlap terrain especially if you're playing distress sounds and but if you're in the right type of train if you put yourself in those positions um consistently enough and good good setups um and, and you know how animals um the specific species live then then you're going to have an opportunity and i think any animal is callable and so you know we start out and uh uh first stand we did 12 total stands in two days we actually had three days to hunt we ended up calling the lion in on the 12th stand. The first day we did uh, six stands. Um, people are like, six stands? Well, we're calling anywhere from 40 to minutes to an hour, and then plus your walk time into some of these places. Um, we're calling big country um, as long as the wind will allow it. Um, and we were on a, a, a small tabby or female lion's track a couple different times, um, but uh, we didn't catch up to her and uh the first day and so we continued down a ridge line trying to catch up to her on the second day well i think we i think she'd looped on us somewhere and i'm not sure where um but uh we we made five stands the day we called in the big tom and he was our second to last stand and uh we we just continued working the country um in a somewhat strategic you know, manner, um, trying to catch up to, to a lion. Um, I, we did cut a lion track in there that I believe was his a couple stands before. Um, and, and I knew we were in an area where there, there could be a big Tom, um, because I'd, I'd seen his track in there a few times, um, over the last couple of years. But anyway, we, we got set up on the, on the stand. It was in great country for a lion, um, there was some mule deer in there. Um, there was some ridge structuring going on. Um, that it was thick. Um, it, but we went to set up um, or, or place our stand, stand or set up, depends on what you call it. And uh, I was calling with a Fox Pro call. And I'd walked 100 yards down this ridge. And I like to look at the opposite side of the of the mountain or the bottom i like to be able to see the opposite ridge or the bottom when i'm calling for cats doesn't matter if it's a bobcat Bye. or lion because they will they, they will sometimes go up there and and set and not that i'm speaking that i know a lot about lions but i know bob and they'll look across yeah, kind of yeah, observe the deal. yeah but i know bobcats and and a cat's a cat um and so when we were approaching the stand i was getting a little irritated because it was very thick and uh, Ian was shooting a two two three, and we didn't have a shotgun. And I was afraid I was going to bump something. And, and to be quite honest with you, I got a little bit frustrated because I couldn't get the right setup. And so I, I looked at this little small opening that was about 20 yards across. And I said, and uphill, I said, Ian, go sit there. And I'm going to set the call right here in this tree. And I set the decoy up and the call up in the tree. And when I turned and looked back at Ian, he'd moved about three foot to the left of where I actually thought he was going to sit. Um, but that was just lack of communication. And it still wasn't a bad spot. 
Um, when I turned and looked back up at him after I noticed that, I walked up to where I wanted him to sit, and I sat down. And as soon as I turned and sat down, I thought, man, that was a crappy spot to sit to call or to place the call. And you knew right away. The reason away. being is because it rolled down, and I couldn't see anything down. I could see a small opening where I could see the opposite side ridge. Um, and so, yeah, it was just one of those gut feelings, and I was just like, crap, screw it, let's just call. So nothing fancy, rabbit distress. Um, first four minutes, I hear Ian say, something big's coming, I think it's a deer. And he goes on the opposite ridge. And we kind of got our locations mixed up as far as we both knew it was on the, I knew it was on the opposite side ridge, but I thought it was coming from the left. It actually came from the right. Well, I didn't see it. Well, afterwards, Ian told me, he goes, I knew it was a lion, but I didn't want to be, I didn't want to say anything because I, I just, I just didn't want to be a dumbass. And I didn't want to be that guy, the guy that said there was a lion coming. And it turned out to be a deer. And uh, so, for whatever reason, he said it was a deer. Well, I I turned the camera on because I knew whatever it was was going to end up at the call. And he was already pointing in that direction with his rifle. And, you know, uh, the camera ran for for three and a half minutes. Um, and then, because um, I, I went back and looked at the time code on it, and it was three and a half minutes. Uh, it took that lion to come up basically 150 yards. So he paused down there somewhere and sat down below the call and looked before. Which is where if you would have seen, if you'd have been able to see the bottom, you'd have been able to shoot. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, he, I caught his tail coming in. And when, as soon as I seen his tail, of course, I knew it was a lion. It reminded me of when you flipped up a sheet to make your bed. The tail was doing that motion coming in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, filmed it. It was three and a half seconds. And from my angle, everything was exposed on the line. He reached up to grab my call and then he come back down and he acted like he was going to take a second reach. But I don't know exactly what he's going to do. From from Ian's angle, though, all he could see. And I and this is this is not this is not an excuse. But this is the truth. He's sitting three foot to my right and just about six inches lower, and he's also shorter than me. And we reenacted the whole thing with my backpack and, you know, him looking through the rifle scope. And, you know, we knew exactly where that line sat. And when I went back and looked at his, what he was looking at was totally different. He was actually, all he could see was the line top of his neck and his head. And he elected to shoot him through a little brush where he thought the shoulder was. And um, so with with that being said, he 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 shot the lion. Um, the lion ran out and uh, we decided to back off the lion that that night. And uh, we went home and uh, I don't know how much I can disclose because I want to disclose it on Hunt for More. But, uh, yeah, we called him the lion in 12 stands. So, That's unbelievable. And that is awesome. And we're going back out to do it again. Um, Arizona is a multiple bag limit state in some of the some of the units. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, and that that was one of those things. Whereas, you know, if it would have been a stranger, you know, that didn't know me, um, I would have never tried to sell that hunt or book that hunt. But it, the expectations were there, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, Ian knew. Well, sometimes you take a shot in the dark and it pays it, off. I and, mean, it, it, you know. but it was, it was, I mean, it's like you with your, one of your best clients when, you know, you say, Hey, let's go hunt or, or, or they say, Hey, I want to go hunt here and I want to hunt with you. And you're like, okay, but realize that I haven't done this before. So it's unproven. Right. And they're like, yeah, Jay, I want to hunt with you. And right. so you're well, I think that's a te- testimony to, you know, how good a, you know, guy you are to be around. And he just wants to go hunt with you. And if it's, you know, exploring the new frontier, <laughs> then it's exploring the new frontier. And I think that's awesome. I think that's great to be able to build a bond with a client that he's thinking, you know, yeah, I know this is going to be low odds, but let's give it a whirl. And dang, if it didn't work. Yeah, no, for, for sure. We, I mean, with that being said, 
did we get a little lucky? Of course, but we also put forth the effort and had a plan. And, you know, we we ended up pretty blessed. So, and we're going to yeah, try to do it again. That's, that's awesome. Uh, a quick side note to that. I um, saw my 41st lion in the field down in Mexico. And uh, I actually saw three. I saw four in one day. Uh-huh. Uh, I saw what I think was a mom and two kittens, full-size kittens, together. Uh, and they kind of went over this ridge, and we... We they were too far away to like go after you know plus it was kind of prime time so we went on up the ridge in the ranger about three quarters of a mile and I was sitting there glassing for deer and I hear this rare 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 anyway ended up seeing another lion and uh, so that made four in one day and the reason I know it was four is because then we drove back down three quarters of a mile down like you know an hour later. And danged if the three didn't come back over the same ridge, basically playing around on that same hill. And, you know, one thing when I see these lions that it never, you know, it seems like that tail never stops. Yeah. Like you said, it just, it's always, the tip of the tail is just always moving. It's always moving. And it, it's amazing, you know, I, I haven't seen... I've seen a lot compared to some, but haven't seen very many compared to a lot of people. You've seen more um, than I have. But it's mind-blowing how easy they move throughout the country, and it's amazing to me how much they're just like your house cat out in the backyard, mm -hmm. how they, they're so curious, and they move slow, and then they move fast, and then they'll sit and watch, and their ears flick, and, you know, it's just, they're a cool definitely a cool animal so um good luck with you and ian uh on your future hunts and uh it's been great having you on the podcast as always um you know uh, if you guys don't follow craig Steele, uh you gotta follow the hunt for more series on orchunt.com um he, he, he also the the videos are what held on your youtube channel yep but you can get them right there on orchunt.com. You can follow Craig on Instagram. Uh, what is it? At Craig Steele AZ. Yep. Um, and uh, Exclusive Pursuits. Um, exclusive Pursuit Outfitters. Yes, sir. And Predator Exclusive on Instagram. And uh, you're a great friend, great friend of the podcast. And appreciate I know our listeners always love uh, hearing you. Thanks so. for having me on, Jay. Awesome, buddy. You take care, right, bud.